Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and welcome to another episode of Media Matters for Anfield Index. It's Brighton Part 1 done and dusted, isn't it? The Carabao Cup victory 3-2, a Cody Gapo double, a Luis Diaz winner. We didn't even think it would be because there was a few dubious goals or things to talk about. And here to discuss that and the return leg at Anfield is the renowned and the respected David Lynch. David, it's it's a weird one when I'm looking this morning because I'm seeing a lot of sort of action on my timeline and Twitter saying Arna Slot needs to learn to connect with Liverpool fans more. Winning is the best connection, isn't it, surely? Yeah, I would, I would think so. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, it's not even to me like he's kind of a, a cold character either. I think we've seen like flashes of re- real personality from him. He, you know, he'll crack jokes at times. He's... You know, he's not Jurgen Klopp, obviously. I think everyone had to acknowledge that you weren't going to get another Jurgen in terms of pure, uh, you know, charisma. One of the most charismatic leaders in in any field, never mind just football. Um, but but iconic in that sense. But um, but I think Arna Slot's not exactly a, a robot either. I don't think he's kind of quite Rafael Benitez levels of, of withdrawn. So um, I, and like, as you say, I think winning is the most important thing of all, really. And I think to win, win twelve, draw and one. Um, and lost one is, you know, if someone had told you that was how his first 14 games were going to go, then I think anyone would have taken that to snatch your hand off. So, um, yeah, I, I think he's building up a pretty decent rapport with the supporters and he wants to keep winning to ensure that it stays that way as well. So, um, and I've got full faith that he will because it's been a, an unbelievable start, really. Yeah, you, you couldn't really have asked for any more at all. And we'll get into, ladies and gents, the normal. So we'll talk last night, the Brighton Cup game. And, it was an interesting one, David, because eight changes, almost a Bosley in a false nine. So you can tell those people like Bradley pushed higher than the right back normally goes. There was a, a bit of adaptation, but a victory is a victory. What did you make of the actual performance itself? Yeah, I thought it, within the context, I thought really, really good, which is, you know, the context being obviously Slot didn't feel like he could th- throw Nunez in again. So he's, he's left without a sort of recognised striker. So it goes to this kind of... I thought it was kind of a, a lot of the game really more of a four four two with with Jones mm. and Sobers like both is kind of false nines and it's something we actually saw him do in pre season if you remember um, when when he didn't have any of his strikers available he kind of tried this out and it worked pretty well really so um, it's obviously something he's been thinking about doing again and and, and again I thought it, it worked well I thought you know you can't forget the Brighton have, have, have had one over on, on Liverpool in recent times it's been been a really tricky place to go they've started the season really well. Um, so to get that draw and go there and make eight changes and still um, still give them a game in that regard, I, th- I thought was really really impressive and never going to be perfect and, and as free flowing and as as you know yeah. as closed up in a defensive sense as you would get when you have the, the first eleven out. But I thought to make all those changes and it still so clearly looked like you know kind of how the manager wants them to play. I thought it, it, you know even though the formation is different, so many different players. I thought that's really really good news to Liverpool and, and look really good and. Mm. You know, in terms of the, the metrics kind of look, well, you know, you take a look at just shots. I think it's 19 to 11 in Brighton's favour. So that kind of looks like they've peppered Liverpool. But um, the reality is when the XG totals are pretty even. Uh, and I would say that suggests really that Liverpool, you know, the XG they were generating per each opportunity was was far higher. So they were generating the better quality opportunities. And Brighton, really, their XG has added up a lot of sort of generally poor quality shots and you know, they only get their two goals really through one through a, a, an error and one through a big slice of fortune. So, uh, you know, Liverpool could have in the end won that quite comfortably and you would have said they deserved it. So uh, for me, it was a, you know, not a, a, a performance to write home about, but definitely one that was good enough to win and deserved to win uh, and, and did win at a place, as I say, that is is tricky to go and against a side that's full of confidence. So I thought loads and loads of positives from last night. Yeah, definitely. Especially, like you say, it was reminiscent of almost that first pre-season game that we saw. And we talk about a a slot team, which is important to say. People almost forgot in the first half, we nearly, nearly saw two brilliant team goals, didn't we? The one where Zabozlai has his shot blocked, almost both start to finish from Yarosh involved all the way through the team. And then the one where Robbo sort of has it saved. There was a lot to like about the overall play, wasn't there? Well, that's it. That's exactly what we're saying about kind of to make that many changes and still be able to play that sort of football. That's that's, you know, again, we've got to remember 
you know, Arne Slot only came in over the summer and the fact he's got them playing in this way already. I mean, I know they weren't playing hoofball under Jurgen Klopp and, it, you know, it's not entirely new, but there is a sort of new sort of um, an element of wanting to play in this sort of, you know, a bit more of this passing football, a bit less direct. And he, he's already got them got them doing it, which I just think is incredibly impressive and, and with so many changes to do that. And as you say, a couple of really nice moves there, a couple of sort of high quality chances made off the back of those. And I just thought that was Liverpool all night, really. They, all the way through the game, they created decent opportunities, obviously score three in the end. Um, and, and they didn't really give up good quality opportunities mm. to, to Brighton, except for maybe a couple um, so I just, yeah, just loved a, a, a lot of the performance, really. And I just think it bodes well that, that Liverpool are doing this. It's such an early stage under slot that they can uh, they can mix and match the team and, and still look really cohesive. Um, so really, yeah, lots to like about it. Yeah, absolutely tons. And one player that we know absolutely loves the Carabao Cup is Cody Gakpo. Loves a double in the Carabao Cup as well. And I mean, the goals were brilliant, but this season he's been great. Last night, he was on fire, wasn't he? Yeah. Do you know what? And I kind of said this, actually, my my post-match, my video on YouTube, uh, that we, we, we almost shouldn't really... We're, we're being unfair pointing out how good he is in the Carabao Cup because he's been good in the Champions League when he's come in and, and, and he, you know, he can be good in the Premier League. He's a, he's just a really important player. And he's unfortunate Diaz offers what he does because that that's what's kind of keeping him out, that more sort of along the, the, the first-choice team at the moment. But every time he comes in, he doesn't let you down. It, I think he's really benefiting, isn't he, from from having it sort of set that he's just on that left hand side now. He doesn't have to think about anything else, being the false nine or anything like that. Um, you just go out there and, and kind of be yourself. And himself is someone who comes in off that left and has got an unbelievable shot on him. Uh, the the power he put behind it, well, both of them really. I mean, the second one in particular, I guess, because he beats beats the keeper at his near post just for pure pace on the ball. Um, yeah, he's just he's just got a hammer of a of a right foot, so. And he just looks really comfortable. Looks like he's enjoying his football at the moment. So great to see because it's someone who kind of, you know, people were getting a bit frustrated with him towards the end of Jurgen's tenure, and he didn't really sort of seem to know what to do with him. But he looks, he looks com- comfortable now, and, and as I say, confident as well. And yeah, I, I thought he was man of the match yesterday. Br- brilliant performance from him again. And I'm sure there are many more of those to to come this season because he's uh, he's looking in great form. Yeah, th- those two strikes. Almost reminiscent of a former Dutchman, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. Almost that ability to just smash a ball with practically zero backlift as well. Just blam it past the keeper. And I was going to ask you, because Gakpo's been interesting this season. Very much last year there was talk about, has he got that aggression, the bit between his teeth? Do you think it is just confidence or do you think almost something has clicked in him this campaign so far? I do think he was moving towards improvement towards the back end of Jurgen, just purely on the basis that, you know, it, it was clear they'd, they'd had a conversation, hadn't they, the two of them, about him being a bit more physical and aggressive. And it, and rightly so, by the way, because he's a giant, you know, he, he, he's such a waste to have all that physical quality and not use it and impose it on on the opposition. So I think that, I think what Jurgen had kind of said to him in the chat that they'd had has helped, but also... I think with Slot, you know, he's very much about getting his wide people into sort of into position, isn't he? And he, he really, that's the sort of an emphasis, particularly on that left-hand side where we, we saw a lot of Diaz under Jürgen. It was like, okay, get the ball near the fullback and try and drag us up the pitch. Um, and then whenever Gakpo is used there, okay, well, you do what Diaz does. And it's, you know, I, I think Slot is a bit more focused on getting, getting Gakpo basically into that 1v1 situation up against either a centre-half or a fullback where he's, he has to take two touches to cut inside and then he can just use that shot that he's got. So I think that's I think that's part of it really is, is how the setup is working and the fact that the team is functioning. And Slot always says that, doesn't he? It's kind of not as much about individual improvement, although I think we can already see he's definitely doing that in his coaching. But it's about creating an environment for the players and, and I think the environment and the way that the team is set up really suits Gakpo's strength. So that's why we're, we're seeing a bit more of the, of the best of him this season. Yeah, absolutely. And brilliant last night. And it is important to say, because we've talked about it before, that left side of attack, probably the the strongest in depth position, because you've got Gakpo and Diaz there having a real slugfest, which is great at the moment. It was good to see Diaz on the score sheet, though, wasn't he? Because it almost got ignored. He had a brilliant start to the season, but he'd not actually scored in October. But this was a, a goal that'll probably help his confidence a bit as well, won't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, doing a job for the team last night in terms of he's, he's much more comfortable on that left-hand side, isn't he? But, he? but he can function out on that right. So he did that. And I thought he took his goal 
uh, really, really well. And as you say, it's his first for a while. He, he'd been on fire at the start of the season. So, so good to see him back on the score sheet. I mean, you know, we, we're saying about sort of aims for him this season in the Premier League. And, and after he starts with five goals so early, you're thinking, well, you know, he, he could be going for 20 here. But, uh, but I still thought the, the more realistic expectation for him after that, even after that start was kind of, if he can get 12 to 15 in the Premier League, that would be absolutely amazing. And he's still kind of on track for that, but he just needs to get, you know, get back amongst the goals in the Premier League as well. But it, it never hurts to score in competitions like this or to score ever. Um, that that will be really helpful for him, and he, you know, just like Gakpo, I know they're battling for the same position, generally speaking, but you know, both massively important to what Liverpool want to achieve yeah. this season. Yeah, absolutely. As long as they keep this form up and battling each other, it bodes well for us. And I mean, the keeper position is the other one that we weren't sure if Yaros was going to start, and it sounds weird because we conceded two goals, but he was really good last night. There were some brilliant saves, weren't there? Yeah, I thought he did really well. I mean, not a lot he could do about either goal. Obviously, one takes a, a humongous deflection, and this the other one actually he say, he just makes a really good save before it, and then it just it kind of bounces fortuitously for for to, for it to be swept home. So, uh, but I, I thought otherwise, yeah, really really good. Um, you know, that the save from Adingra is is absolutely out of this world, isn't it? The one where he's coming back across from the header and to tip it onto the post is is sensational, and then. I just thought he looked really comfortable generally. I mean, you know, similar to when Kelleher comes in and you kind of, the ones that for me are always a really good tester of goalkeepers is when someone has a shot and it bounces just in front of them um, and a lesser keeper can spill those. And there's a couple of those last night and Kelleher always does it, just grasps it and you think, wow, you know, the, these keepers are good and, and Yaros did, yeah. did exactly the same with a couple of efforts last night and just really good handling. I thought he just looked confident, looked really good with the ball at his feet as well. Yeah. Um, he's just got all those qualities that a Liverpool goalkeeper should have. And it, it clearly shows why Slot was so keen to to speak about him kind of unprompted early in the season. He, he, he clearly saw they've got a very, very good goalie there. And, and, and Liverpool clearly do. And they're so, so blessed in that position at the moment. Yeah, he really did look quality. And I know you'd written this on your, your stub stack about it because everyone's fascinated by the accent as well, more than anything. But if you look on transfer market, it does say right this second that Yaros's contract expires at the end of the season, but that's not your understanding or belief, is it? No, no. So he, he signed a new contract, a, a long-term contract, when he before he went out on his last loan, which was to Sturm Graz. So that would have been in January uh, last season. So he is he is tied down. I'm not sure why transfer marks have got him down for for uh, expiring this summer, but that isn't the case. So Liverpool are kind of protected there. Uh, not exactly clear where you know what that means in terms of what they do with him because obviously Mamadashvili's in the mix. Yeah. We do think Keller will go, but uh, you know what are they going to do with Mamadashvili? What happens with Allison? Does Yarosh want to be second choice if if Allison leaves and Mamadashvili comes in as first? You know, it's a few things and a few spinning plates there, or, or whether he goes out on loan next season, we'll have to we'll have to kind of see what what happens with that. But um, yeah, good news that Liverpool have him tied down, and also if people want to. Find out about that stuff a little earlier. Yeah, you can subscribe to my Substack. <laughs> well, yeah, well worth a read. And I suppose the, the other thing I did want to ask you about about this game, we've talked about the players that came in, eight changes. As much as Yaros did really well, anyone else you think came in and really grabbed sort of headlines or didn't do their cause any harm at all? I thought Joe Gomez was was very good in in everything he did. Showed you know. Good pace to, to cover off a lot of the time, just very composed in possession. They liked a lot about his performance. I quite like Tyler Morton as, as well. Some some nice, mm. real nice touches from him and getting stuck in. Um, and, and, you know, him and Endo as a pair kind of, it, it worked and Liverpool were, were controlling for, for periods of the game and, and doing okay, as I say, with all those um, changes around them. So, so no real complaints there. I think, I, I just don't think that the, the strange thing is, is that, I don't think it does Endo or, or Morton a favour, to be honest, regardless. I mean, it, it's great for them to have come in and played well, but I still think Endo's in that position where he's, he's lower down the pecking order. And I think with Morton, again, you know, I still think he's a candidate for a move in January, really. I, I just think, you know, the, the fact he didn't come in for the West Ham game suggests to me that one of the big reasons he's been involved here is because there's, there's injuries and, and it's sort of the manager's felt he's had to, but it's not really like he's kind of a massive part of the plans. And that's no reflection on his quality, by the way. I think he's a brilliant player. I thought he did did really well last night and I think he's going to get a good move. But clearly the manager just doesn't think it's the right fit for what he needs and he, he maybe needs something else in midfield. So um, 
but but I thought that the the two of them actually in midfield I thought did pretty well really and um, yeah and fair play to them because it's hard when you're coming in and you you've not played a lot and you're out of rhythm um, and you ostensibly know that you're not in the manager's plans but I, I thought they did really well. Yeah, and there, there was a few touches that Morton did were almost baby Thiago esque, weren't they? Just little swivels inside or open up his body. So even if it's shop window, he's not done himself any harm at all. I would say about it, Morton as well. It kind of surprises me that he's not part of the plans. I mean, I, I get it with Endo in that he is very much that, that archetypal destructive midfielder, isn't he? Give the short pass, win it, give the short pass. But Morton sort of, I thought Morton might have, because of that, maybe have leapt ahead of Endo in the pecking order and be, because he seems more of a fit, really, for what this manager wants, which is someone who can set the tempo, can fire the passes through the lines, got a good passing range. Uh, Morton seems a good fit for that. But obviously, you know, we don't see them in training every day. You know, I'm sure Slot has got a good idea of where he's at level-wise and whether that is exactly what Liverpool kind of need at the moment. Um but I'm still sure he'll get a really good move when he does go because I, I, you know, I think there is a lot of quality there, and he showed it in his last loan spell, and also the fact that you know, a club like RB Leipzig was was interested in him over the summer, and you know, says a lot about how good he is. Yeah, absolutely. So many positives for that. Like I say, even if it is a shop window move, that's all good. And the other side, I do want to touch on from last night that. Andy Robbo starts again, and we were quite critical, I think quite rightly, of his performance against Arsenal. You thought this is a great chance to almost re-establish is probably too strong, but just put it to bed. It didn't really work out the way he wanted, did it again? Yeah, thought thought it was another tough night for him, really. I, I kind of feel sad talking about this, really, at the, at the moment. It feels like there's been a, a bit of a drop-off there, a bit of a decline, and, and, and yeah, it seems like he's struggling. I mean, yeah... I, Last night, kind of, I think he wins one out of seven duels, and he's, he's dribbled past four times. So statistics kind of really bore out what we felt we were watching as well, which was that he was struggling to keep a hold on on Brighton's wingers, and he was he was out of position quite a bit. And yeah, it's just just I don't know whether he's just lost that yard, or maybe he's carrying a little knock or whatever. But he's he really does sort of seem to be uh, to seem to be struggling at the moment. And I mean, it's interesting as well, kind of what it means for him in terms of him being in the team last night. Um, yeah. You know, there's a couple of ways you can kind of look at that. You know, does it mean that Costas Simicas is a is kind of ahead of him, or do, you know, does it mean that it's just a kind of rotation because it's by Leverkusen coming up and maybe you're playing that game? I'm not entirely sure, but I, I, I thought you know either way, I thought he really struggled last night. I was going to ask you like how you see because we kind of alluded to that we'd have to see with these next few games. I mean, we're a second one in and it really didn't go the the way Robbo was wanting. It maybe seems a bit dramatic to go a changing of the guard, so to speak, fully. But if you're just picking on form and what we've seen this season, Simicast is probably in the team right now, isn't he, ahead of him? Yeah, I, I would say so. And, I, you know, I'd say rightly so if he is, because I think his form has been pretty decent this season, pretty steady. And Robertson's clearly hasn't really. And so you've got you've got to pick on form and and and, and slot's shown in the past he'll, he'll do that as well i mean throwing jones in at arsenal was a was a form decision i think uh you know dragging quanta off at half time against dip switch and throwing canate in and then keeping canate in the team that's you know a form decision mm -hmm. so um he's clearly making those kinds of, of calls and and i think at left back it is clear but i mean it will be interesting we'll get a real insight if Simicast starts the next two, then it's clear that he is the first choice left back, and and that's. Um, but if it's the case that Simicast starts against Brighton and then Robertson comes back in against by eleven, we'll have to see. So maybe is it just a case of that kind of rotation? But um, yeah, I I personally think that Simicast should be in there. But but I still also as well, you know, you say about changing the guard. This is a kind of twenty three year old who's coming in and is ready to to take that spot in the long term. I mean, Simicast is twenty eight himself. Um, I, I still think it speaks to the fact that Liverpool should be looking at a signing in that position because, you know, Simicast, I, I think, has been a, an unbelievable backup for Liverpool down the years. But in terms of him being first choice in the long term, I'm not quite sure he's that level. Um, so, yeah, that, I, I still think that's an area that Liverpool really should look to, to strengthen soon as they can. Yeah, we talked about it last time, didn't we? May even be jumping ahead of the midfield at the moment, the way it's going. Fing fingers crossed for Robbo that we do see something a bit more from him, like his old self. But yeah, next few games will be interesting. I suppose the final player in that centre I want to see that 
up until about the 80th minute, everything is going swimmingly for Jarrell Kwanzaa. And then it just kind of unravels, doesn't he, from, from that dribble, loses the, loses the ball, Brighton score. Very unlucky with the deflected goal as well. That, that can happen to anyone. But what did you make of the slot withdrawal? Because I kind of took that as, this is the last few minutes, it's injury time, we need to be solid. It almost had those echoes of Ipswich half-time, didn't it, a little bit? Yeah, I was, I was quite surprised, to be honest. I mean, no no question, Paul around giving away the, the goal for 2-1. Um, you know, he, he's he's key to that. And, you know, you, you, you can't do that at this level. I know he's he's lacking a bit of match sharpness at the moment because he's, he's not really in the team and that can make it difficult. But that is the sort of error you need to stamp out. And, you know, he made that against Manchester United away last season and it was kind of, OK, let's not see this again. And, and, and we have kind of seen it again, a different sort of error, but, you know, switching off. Still so young, by the way, that you know we shouldn't be unfair on him in, in that regard. He is still learning, but you know the standards are incredibly high, and and, and you, you've got to meet them. And he, he didn't in that moment by giving the ball away. So that's something for him to kind of to kind of think about. I, I did. I was surprised with the with being him being brought off. Um, the the second goal, you know, you, you cannot blame him for that. That's it's just a deflection. So so unlucky the way that goes in and and off him and. Um, I'd like to think Slot wasn't blaming him for that, or maybe that was a, a substitution he planned. But in terms of shoring up, you know, could he have brought Canate on for a forward instead just to see it out? Not, you know, you really hope that kind of doesn't dent Quanta's uh, confidence. But, but uh, you know, there's two ways of looking at this, and that, you can't be definitive on it either way because I don't think any of us know exactly what the dressing room dynamic there is. But it either kind of, you know, ruins his confidence or it sends a message that. The level's got to be high here. You've got to do better. Don't, you know, don't do that again. And I guess what will decide whether this is good or bad is what the results are in, in the next few weeks. You know, if if Quanta comes in next time and he's flawless and, mm. and we never see that sort of error again, it'll be like, oh, well, this was genius and, and Liverpool keep winning, so nothing Slot can do is wrong. If they start losing, his man management is poor, blah, blah, blah. So I'm sure we'll apply whatever narrative suits further down the line but the reality is it's kind of hard to know exactly what that means how that was felt by Quanta you know what Slot said to him afterwards uh, we don't we don't know that so we, we probably shouldn't put too much judgment on it but I was I was surprised to see him do it I'll say that yeah and it was interesting because after Ipswich he was quite honest quite forthright on the reasons it will be interesting to see does it come up in Friday's press conference at all? Does that get discussed? It will well, be interesting. Yeah, I, I'll ask it if it doesn't. So, yeah. There we go on the docket for that one. And I suppose speaking of his press conference, we didn't really get the news we wanted because we did get injury updates the, the day before, didn't we? That We knew Harvey Elliott would be out a while. Diogo Jota, we got not back until after the international break. I mean, we'll come to Chiesa shortly, but Diogo Jota, I mean... Just very, very unlucky, or will you understand the ones that are claiming this player's injury pro? Yeah, I mean he is he is injury pro, and there's no doubt about it. But I think if he gets through through a season without having the muscle injuries, which have been which are, for me are the ones that you worry about, um, if you can avoid them, then then that's the kind of that's the measure. I mean, uh, what happened to him is he's unavoidable. That's just one of those things, really. I don't think you could call him injury prone for that one. Um, it's whether he, you know, the, the main problem will be it's okay if he misses a few weeks now. But it's not okay. You'd, you'd rather him be there, but yeah. it's one of those things. But then if you add to that two or three muscle injuries throughout the season, then all of a sudden he's missed sort of 15 games of the Premier League season and you massively missed him. That's when it becomes a problem. If this is just a kind of one off, that's, that's not an issue. It's, it's avoiding any other injuries and, and other muscle issues that he's had in the past. So that, for me, is the main measure of, of, of his importance and, and what Liverpool are doing with him to to keep him fit, really. But, yeah, no no question, it's a blow. And I, I would also say about this, um, that is some bruising to keep him out for that long. I, yeah. I would be surprised if there's not a little fracture there or, you know, some some sort of break of the rib or something. Um, because, I, you know, the, the fact that they could flat out say, um, that he won't be back till till this time with bruising mm. really surprises me because it, you, you, basically that would be a sort of see how we go injury and, and if it feels better one day you can train and, and whatnot. So I, I suspect there's more made of it and I, I was kind of upbeat about what this injury was going to be and, and the length of time he'd be out on the basis of them saying bruising. Um, but I feel that that was maybe an outright lie. So yeah, a, a blow for Liverpool but only three more games to go to that international break and then hopefully he's back after that and 
uh, yeah, and hopefully no further injuries after that. Yeah, it does feel like a massive, we keep saying it, but another huge three games coming up. And I suppose the other injury news that, we, again, we got a bit more in depth for Arna Slot. Chiesa, almost hokey cokey in his way in and out of training a little bit, isn't he? And Arna Slot even mentioned the, the intensity of the impact. People, when we signed Chiesa, obviously flagged his injury record and understandably. Is this a worry for you that we've not really seen him have a sort of run and we're already talking about intensity and in and out of training already? Yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to see him get pre-season, wouldn't it? Especially under this new regime, which is all about kind of injury prevention, really big on how they build the players up before a season to make sure they're ready. Uh, you know, would he have been better prepared if that had happened because he barely barely did have a pre-season at all at Juve? So that's kind of robbed him of something. I think the key here is to just wait until it's right. And then, and then you know, once he's fully fit and he's, he's ready and they feel he has had that preparation... Then again, you know, again, we'll make the judgment then on whether the sort of fitness record is good enough or whatever. Um, it, it's just frustrating at the moment because you know it's a, it's the only sign in Liverpool added to the squad at the moment, and yet yeah. you know, we haven't seen anything of him. You know, when are we going to see anything of him? We we don't kind of know. And you know, Liverpool could have done with him last night, for example. You know, it, it just puts more strain on the squad not having him. You know, you have to put Diaz in there yesterday, and you know, you could have he could have had the night off if it would have been Kies, or he could have played twenty minutes instead. Um, so that is why it's really, really frustrating and, and Liverpool need to get it right. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Slot alluded to Ben Doak in his pre-match press conference. I, I think mm. he's already thinking I'm maybe a little bit light in certain areas and, and the intensity of the Premier League is is a lot. And, and this is kind of, and you have to throw in the League Cup, which he didn't have in, in Dutch football. You know, he's maybe thinking I, I could probably do with a couple here to, to make this squad a bit yeah. stronger. And, and, and it could also do with having Chiesa fit. So, um, yeah, it's just one they need to get right ASAP, really, because, you know, it, it will be so handy to have that squad option. And you just hope it's not going to drag into the rest of the season now and he's never going to quite be right or whatever. And we'll wait until next preseason to say, OK, well, you know, this is the season for him. Uh, you just really hope it's not one of those. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how he sort of progresses, I guess. Yeah, it, it will be interesting to see how he gets on. And it kind of alluded to a little bit of the next section I wanted to ask you about, because forward line, funnily enough, it has been the talk. Obviously, Chies is now on the docket. Jota, as we talked about there, and his injury concerns. And interestingly, as a few people have started to flag, yes, we've had good news on the Quanta contract and Canate seems close, but both Diaz and Jota will have two years left in the summer. Everyone knows the Mo Salah situation. There's the Nunes conundrum that's going on at the moment. So there's a lot of question marks around the forward line. And it's come up there on the banner, ladies and gents, a few names that are, are coming out recently. Victor Jokeres, the sort of the sporting Lisbon striker, he's been banging them in there as well. Interesting questions around Amarim at the same time now. Marmouche from Frankfurt. Are you expecting changes to this forward line? I'm, I'm almost saying changes in plural, or do you think it might just be one alteration? I think there's a chance they don't do anything to the forward line this summer, but but it relies a lot on kind of what happens, you know, what does the rest of Darwin Nunes' season look like? What happens with Mo Salah's contract? There's a lot kind of up in the air there. Uh, you know, you, you could easily see a situation where, you know, Jota, Diaz, Gakpo, um, uh, Chiesa, obviously, they're, they're, they're pretty much nailed on to be here next season. And then it's kind of what happens with the other two there, really, in terms of their contract and, and Nunes you know kind of proven himself a little bit but you know because there is that uncertainty of no doubt whatsoever that Liverpool are looking at forward options I think Marmouche uh, age profile wise price um, what he's doing goal scoring wise in, in the Bundesliga at the moment seems mm -hmm. like a very Liverpool link he makes a lot of sense but I don't think Liverpool are going any further than kind of monitoring and, and I, I know you know they monitor an awful lot of players at this time of the season as well that they're, they're keeping an eye uh, on uh, on a lot of footballers, so it, I, you know I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of hang my hat on Liverpool even signing a forward full stop this summer. There's a lot up in the air on that one, um, and on Jocker is as well. I, I, I'm a little bit of a skeptic over him, if I'm honest. I know it sounds ridiculous with his goal scoring record in Portugal, but you consider some of the players who've been top scorers in Portugal in recent years, and and how that's translated to other leagues. That you know, and also you know, and I know people say he was brilliant at Coventry, but again. You know, Tuber Akpom's outscored him in that championship season. Yeah. And, you know, I doubt anyone was sort of 
desperate to, to sign him for Liverpool or convinced that it would absolutely translate to the Premier League. That is a huge step up. And the step from the Portuguese league to the Premier League is absolutely massive as well. So, um, and I've got a friend in Portugal actually who's watched him a few times and said, you know, kind of he's a physical bully, but when he comes up against defenders who are of similar stature or or the the, the calls aren't going his way with the ref, he's he's kind of easy to quiet him down a little bit. So for me, I, I really, really, I'm not just skeptical on him as a player, and, and I always say I'm not a scout, so I probably am wrong about this. Mm. I'm also kind of sceptical that Liverpool will look at the price tag and, and think that it's the right move for them, to be honest. So um, that is one I, I pretty much feel confident now, saying that I'd be really, really surprised if he ended up at Liverpool. Yeah, is it, when you see the the ages as well, because Jokic is 27 in the summer, isn't he? Marmouche is yeah. currently 26. So it will be interesting to say. They are around, but could they be? It's crazy to say, even a little bit old for FSG. We'll find out. Interesting comment as well there. Can David play the guitar or is it just to look pretty in the background? Go on, I'll throw that one to you. Yeah, I keep, people on YouTube keep asking me about this and I said I'll uh, I'll play something on it when um, if Liverpool win either of the big two trophies this season. So, um, yeah, no, I've been playing for like nearly 30 years now. So, yeah, I can, I can do a bit, I'll say. If we win the league, I'm sure we can do an impromptu one, put it that way. We'll have to see what happens, ladies and gents. And I suppose we've We've done Brighton part one, but we're actually moving now into, say, a return leg, but it's the league fixture. It's at Anfield. It's Saturday, 3 p.m., which we don't have too many of it, in all honesty. Are you looking at last night and thinking, well, in a good way, we saw Ryan Gravenberg enjoying a dinner with his missus in a restaurant, so he's back in. Probably, Do you think it was more about we got clues for what the weekend will be in this one? Yeah, well, I, I think we, we, we get clues in the sense that I think he's got at the moment a kind of a really settled first eleven, hasn't he? I think for the Premier League games, and as close as he kind of wants to get to that, I think the one question mark is that Simicast decision, and I do fully expect he'll come in against Brighton, regardless of whether he starts the next one after that. But I think that's that's the key one. But I think he's got he has got a quite settled eleven at the moment um, that he likes to go back to, and that he's feeling really good keeping in a rhythm. Um, so, so I th- yeah. In terms of the clues, I think I think they're all there. In that, I think you and I could probably name what the, what the starting eleven is going to be um, against Brighton pretty pretty easily at the moment because he yeah he does like that settled eleven. But I, but I was glad as well with that that he's not so nailed to having a settled eleven that he uses it in the League Cup. He has to keep making changes there, you know, regardless of what that means to Liverpool going uh, in this in this trophy. I, I think it's it's vital that he doesn't. You know, nail this eleven into the ground and, and 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 you know run them down because it's it's a long old season. And you've got to be careful with that. Yes, yeah, so you think City didn't even bring on Haaland when they were chasing it. Twenty minutes or so for Salah and Nunes. So we have got to manage the minutes. I suppose the final one I wanted to to link to last night before we move on to wider football. Where does the Carabao sit with you? Because there's that element of. It's easy to go. It's fourth out of four. And we can't deny this. There'll be some fans who wouldn't have been that good if we were out. Naturally, want Liverpool to win every game. But it does mean that Southampton in the next round looks very winnable, even away from home with rotation. And then you're going to have two more fixtures because it's still two legs, that semi-final. Where are you sitting on this? Is it just like it's the price of success or can you understand that caution? Yeah, I, I still think, I mean, even if Liverpool get to that that semi, I, I still think, again, I would like to see heavy rotation. I just think it's just, it's lower down on the priority list than it has been for a while, to be honest. I know Slot would love to get that trip to Wembley and would love to win a trophy first up and it would be a, a fantastic start. But I think it just takes so much out of his squad. And Liverpool have already got quietly, picking, have picked up quite a few injuries now. So, you know, they've got, they got is it four or five out at the moment. And, and yeah. you know, it, do add to that. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, particularly because Liverpool have won it a couple of times in recent years, I, you know, I just don't think it's such a huge priority for them. Um, and I'd rather rotate in the next two ties and, and you know, maybe you have to go out and it and, and that happens um, than, than sort of, you know, go with your strongest 11 in any of them and, and that cause you problems further down the line. You've just got to be careful. The, the intensity is just too high. Um, and, and so, yeah, I really don't want that to cause any problems to Liverpool, really. So, uh, for me, it's still very low priority at the moment. Yeah, it, it will be 
will be a tough one. We'll see who's back in for the next rounds. Fingers crossed there'll be three or four coming back who will be playing in that mm. one as well. 16th, 17th of December. And the final thing, as we always talk about, wider football. I mean, it's the worst kept secret, isn't it? Pretty much that Ruben Amarim is set to be the new head coach at Manchester United. We broke it live on air. Last episode, we were almost gutted that Eric Ten Hag has departed. With it being Amarim, and we know who it's going to be, is that one where you think, oh, they could have something here? But we've also said that before many times with United. Yeah, so well, I, well, I did a bit of a, a deep dive into him actually on, on YouTube um, over the summer when it looked like he was a potential candidate for Liverpool. And, and what I looked at, I was really, really impressed by. Um, you know, sporting really the, the third highest budget in that league and yet have been a very, very good, uh, well, they, they, you know, consistently challenged for top honours, winning leagues. And um, I think he, he ended a lengthy wait for them actually to win a league title, um, gone well in the Cups. Um, I think one of the big question marks was his European record wasn't fantastic. But again, you've got to place that in the context of the Portuguese league versus some of the leagues that they're coming up against. So, you got to be fair to him in that regard. Although, you know, Slot did have that that conference league run, didn't he? Which which was a helpful boost for him. Um, but but I think a manager who's overachieved his budget and shown real uh, real quality and, and and shown that he's you know got a lot of potential really. So I I do think on the surface of it, it's a, it's a good appointment. And one of one of the concerns, you know, Liverpool did speak to his representatives, and he was you know was a legitimate candidate to become Liverpool manager this summer, but. One of the concerns was sort of understood to be the fact that he's so wed to this three at the back. But I think that for me, that, you know, that was a concern for Liverpool. And I, I totally get why they go down the slot route, um, you know, having a squad that suited him, his style of play is why they've won 12 of the first 14 so far. But I think it's less of a concern for United because I think they need a complete rebuild anyway. I mean, I still I th- even think this summer signings were absolutely appalling, to be honest. Um, but so I think, but I, so I think they need to start from the bottom, the ground up, really, and, and really just rebuild that squad completely. But if you're going to do that, then you know it doesn't really matter what formation the new manager uh, uses, does it? Because he's just going to come in. Everyone's going to have to get used to that. They're going to have to sign players anyway because the ones they've signed are, are terrible. So you know, I don't think that's a, a, a concern for United at all. And I do think they've got a, a young manager who's really smart, really talented. Um, looks like he could turn them into a threat, but the big thing is if he's not held back by how poor their transfer record is, and, and whether that's him getting involved and identifying players, I, I don't know how you know how they fix that if he possibly can. But they've got to get better at signing players, or absolutely no manager is going to be able to sort that out. And I also think it's going to be a couple of seasons before we see them get anywhere near it because well, they're a bit hamstrung cash wise, and, and PSR is a bit of a worry for them, but also because because the scale of the rebuild is so vast that, you know, it would take them time, even if they made the right signings. And I still don't think they will. So yeah, overall, I think good manager still, still think United have got a long way to go. Yeah. He wouldn't be the first good manager that has come unstuck there. And let's hope it does realistically, but we are pretty much at the end, ladies and gents. So the next time we speak, we'll have played Brighton. We'll have Leverkusen on the horizon and Aston Villa before an international break. So All it leaves me to say as ever is, David, for the time, the insight, much appreciated. Thanks for having me. And ladies and gents, that was another Media Matters for Anfield Index.